and when we look at the second learning outcome in this particular uh, module that we are studying, looking at connect, making a link between or a connection between when we talk about leadership and management theories, we also want to make a connect between what are what is the concept of motivation, how as leaders you keep your employees, your staff, uh, you know, people who work for you in the business, keep them motivated, what are the reasons and we need to understand the psychology of how motivation works within the context of job performance. You know, when you look at job descriptions and where does the role of manager and leader, uh, you know, come in when they look at understanding uh, how to keep the staff, the employees motivated, uh, you know, give them work and to be able to get back the results when, uh, when we look at, you know, the concept of, uh, you know, motivation. So theoretically, what we are looking at doing is continuing on our journey to uh, you know, study some more frameworks, but this learning outcome will primarily be focused on, uh, you know, developing an understanding on what what is motivation, the types of motivation theories. Again, we will see through a number of theories which have evolved over the years, the work which has happened, and how do how does the uh, concept of motivation link into the role of leadership, and where does the role of leadership utilize the concept of motivation? When we talk about incentive, bonuses, perks, you know, other things that uh, the management brings in, and those are going to be the things that we want to understand uh, when we create a connect between leadership and motivation. And towards the end, what we are going to look at is we are going to look at something called uh, the concept of something called performance management. And at some stage in the business, all of us look at, um, you know, when we are given a job, job description, when we're given a role to perform or, you know, given a few set of tasks um, to perform or, you know, bring them to a goals, objectives, whatever way you call it, to bring them to a set of bit of completion, then at the end of it, what happens is there is a bit of an evaluation that is done. And that concept, when we look at as a concept in terms of a full loan concept across the organization, will be we'll, we'll defined something as something called performance management. And there are different forms of it. The key word, or maybe the first word which comes to our mind is something called the appraisals. So appraisal is nothing but one of the tools that is used by managers, and in some cases leaders to do uh, and conduct something called performance appraisal. So we look at PMTs, performance management techniques, a few of them, and also look at how they help the leadership and management, uh, you know, leaders and managers within an organization keep a tab on the employees and obviously keep them motivated and use this as a tool towards the end to evaluate how their performance has, has been in terms of, you know, the objectives being met, or the target or the objectives being given, have they been met or have they been not met. So what I've done uh, for LO2 also is I put together a, a few slides and these slides are quite detailed, um, but what we're going to be doing is basically going through this, uh, going through these slides in three parts, and the idea would be to try and understand, uh, you know, the assessment criteria one, which is focused on understanding motivation theories. The second part would be to look at understanding the concept of how leaders use motivation uh, within an organization, and where, here is where we will take a few examples. And towards the end, we will look at the concept of performance management techniques. Now, before I start, you know, because what we need to be able to look at is when we study uh, any module, any unit, we're looking at some keywords. So I'm going to be looking at, you know, picking out some keywords to just put them into context. And when we look at that, the first keyword in this particular learning outcome is motivation. So motivation can be defined in a number of ways. And sometimes, you know, you look at reasons for acting or behaving in a certain way when we look at the dictionary meaning of that. But when we look at it in the context of, you know, how um, this word came about, it is derived from the word which is motive, and which means that everyone has some sort of need, desires, wants, or, you know, some sort of a drive which basically, uh, you know, propels them in a particular direction to achieve certain objectives. So the concept of motivation within an organizational perspective is related to the fact that it talks about uh, the process of how to people, uh, you know, more uh, stimulated within their area of work or within their job role to be able to uh, goals. Okay. 
I would only suggest that, you know, if you're receiving calls, just mute yourself on the other side. But um, beyond that, you know, by all means, take, take calls if you want to. So the process of motivation is primarily from an organizational context, looking at, you know, how do we, how do we for managers stimulate people by, uh, you know, doing certain actions which propels them or, you know, kind of more, uh, drives them, I don't want to use the word motivation, but drives them or propels them forward in a direction to be able to achieve the goals which have been set. So this particular concept, you know, requires leaders and managers to, you know, use a lot of tools and techniques to be able to keep their staff, uh, you know, on the ball. That means they want them to work with them to be able to achieve certain, uh, you know, objectives set in the organization or in the business. And that is where the concept of, you know, motivation actually comes in. So, as I've said, you know, it's derived from the word motive. And sometimes motive for different people are different uh, depending on, you know, the phase of life or, you know, the age and some of the other factors, uh, which are psychological factors, which, uh, you know, basically stimulate a person. So some of them could be things like, you know, people are motivated by getting or earning more money. Some of them are towards achieving success or a greater success. Some of them want recognition. In some cases, some people are content with the fact that, you know, I'm able to, I'm happy in my job. I'm happy that I'm performing 100% to my role. People appreciate me. So they look at job satisfaction. They're happy in the role. They're quite loyal and eager and enthusiastic to come and, you know, obviously start work on a daily basis. So that goes to show that they're quite satisfied in the role that they have. The skill sets which they have are being utilized. And in some cases, some people look at, you know, working within teams. They, they, they like to work within teams to be able to, uh, you know, uh, kind of bring out their best or they like only to part contribute towards a larger objective. So different concepts and different drives or different desires or needs or wants, as we call it, uh, you know, will uh, basically compel individuals to uh, be motivated towards achieving a particular goal. Now, <laughs> When we look at the, you know, broadly, if we look at motivation, if I just have to just step back and say, let's look at the concept of motivation. Now, broadly within the organization, why this is one of the strong pillars to a certain extent, when you wear the leader's hat, you're also looking at, you know, um, at some stage in smaller organizations or when you manage small teams, you're looking at wearing the hat of a leader, but that leader in that hat that you're wearing, you're part the uh, path, uh, you know, playing the role of something called a human resources manager. So when you look at uh, that concept in a small business or in a small team that you manage, you wear that hat wherein you're trying to see what motivates my staff or, you know, my team to deliver a certain objective. And when you look at that, so this becomes one of the key pillars of, uh, you know, um, HR in particular uh, with people within the HR team looking at using this as a tool to, you know, move the organization or, you know, set targets for the organization departments and various set of, you know, um, teams which work. But when we look at that and this being the pillar, what, what are the key three things which kind of drive and bring this into uh, play within an organization? One of the key things that you look at is when you look at characteristic approach, literally speaking, and in some cases when I look at a more strategic side of things when we talk about things which are that this is a goal which needs to be achieved. It's not an easy goal. It's not an easy target, but we need the best team to be put together to be able to give it the best to achieve this particular objective. So when that kind of a, um, you know, motive comes in, say, for example, if the company is looking at launching it, launching a new product. Now, within the organization, we are assuming that, uh, you know, it's a large company. A lot of people work within the company. But within, from within the organization, you will normally see that the person responsible or having the ultimate responsibility to launch the, or has the responsibility of, you know, making this successful in terms of the product launch will draw people from different departments within the company or the people with, which have the best skill sets and they, to a certain extent, are self-motivated to be able to work with which is called design. So some of them because on more, or more uh, some of them want recognition, and some of them in general, you know, work well within the team. So when you put that together, leaders look at, you know, kind of boring 
or you know let's put let's use the word leaders look at kind of you know uh, using motivational techniques to be able to achieve those objectives and here when they pull together that team they look at people who have drive or direction they have the sense of direction where the organization is going and pre understand that in a, in to a certain extent they are willing to put in the efforts and they see persistence within those set of people to relentlessly go after that objective to be able to achieve it and in order to support these three key characters traits they use the pillar of motivation by bringing in incentives bonuses perks additional compensation whichever word we use interchangeably to be able to drive that forward to, to drive this forward to be able to achieve that objective so when we look at that particular concept of uh, you know we broadly look at the concept of motivation there are three things which are driving it uh, you know in any organization and that could be the uh, the sense of direction or direction in general the effort which uh, employees put in and last but not the least the persistence to be able to achieve that goal now based is this what has happened over the years is because there been there has been a lot of research which has been done to understand various motivational theories and various models and frameworks have been put together there are broadly about five that we will look at uh, you know which um, which are quite popular and there is a broad consensus in the market when we look at studying uh, you know these uh, particular five um, theories or models and these five that we are going to be re referring to from mm -hmm. a point of view of this module would be things like um frameworks like maslow's hierarchy of needs which is the oldest model that we will look at and you know there's a lot of extensive work which has been done yeah, and we we'll look at this in a bit more detail yeah, we we'll look at the hulsberg motivation and uh, you know hygiene factor theory we we'll look at theory x and y we we'll look at uh, you know the acquired needs theory and uchi's theory uh, you know motivation which is called the theory z of motivation so let's look at getting into a bit of uh, uh, more detail to understand each of them with one or two slides now maslow's theory of uh, you know hierarchy of needs was suggested that it basically suggests in a nutshell that you know every individual has got some unique qualities and when we look at those unique qualities they lead to some independent choices and different patterns of you know uh, their behavior and need that means they need they have different types of needs and when we look at that um, you know maslow's model basically uh, you know kind of came up with the idea that every individual is unique and in order to meet the requirements which is either direction you know uh, the three broad things that we looked at which is either direction um, you know uh, effort and persistence we have to classify the individual's needs into five categories and he came up with the concept of the pyramid which is uh, you know synonymous with the maslow's theory of motivation in the early 1940s and each layer of the pyramid signifies a different type of need which the individual has depending on the cycle or the phase of his life cycle that the individual is in and it starts off at the base wherein the instincts are looking at survival so the needs are very basic and these basic needs you know when we look at Uh, are you know grouped together at the lower most part of the uh, you know layer or the uh, the bottom layer of the pyramid now when we also look at um, going further once they individualize the basic needs like you know food water shelter kind of things we fulfill what we do get to see um, they are also <laughs> survival they are also called the physiological needs that means you are looking at basically you know at the basic instincts of having food water warm the rest the second level of need the classified as something called security or safety need so here the individual basically looks at you know having some sort of a security so when you can have an employee to any the organization at some stage you know, the basic needs are of survival that you want to go through the probation period once you you know clear the probation period you become a permanent employee and you have a certain amount of security in the job you have a certain amount of say you have a bit of a safety net and that safety net you know looks at giving you things that you are now inducted more or less into the organization and until something drastically goes wrong uh, you, you know you're not going to be shunted out so literally looking at giving an example there and between these two layers when we club them together the security and survival they were clubbed together and called as the basic needs after that 
we have something called you know psychological needs so when we look at the maslow's uh, you know pyramid in particular it's got five different uh, layers but two layers at the bottom were clubbed together to say they were basic needs the other two layers primarily clubbed together which meant belonging and prestige were actually classified into something called psychological needs and psychological needs meant that people here look at belongingness they look at you know making relationships and you know ma making friends because as you become mature in the organization you have spent one or two years and three years you have friends and colleagues who support you understand you quite well and you tend to have a bit of a circle within the organization which is your inner friend circle and then at some stage people have put in say for example a number of years say 10 years in the organization have gone through different sorts of sorts of roles and are now into a position where they either manage or supervise a team they are the needs when i say prestige become esteem needs that means they are they are looking at the feeling of accomplishment they are looking at you know that they as team leaders or as supervisors or as managers are able to accomplish an objective for which they get rewarded separately from the team uh, team reward and the top of the pyramid actually talks about something called the um, you know the self fulfillment needs now here the individual is essentially looking at understanding that i have achieved my full potential and there the person is primarily going after recognition or some sort of a different challenge wherein he gets the opportunity or she the individual will get the opportunity to kind of exemplify what the individual uh, uh, does in terms of either experience that he has gained or in the role and responsibility that that he has been given so this was one particular form uh, you know when we look at when we talk about the uh, you know motivation factors maslow's research which was done in the early 1940s basically looked at you know understanding that um individuals each individuals are different they are, they are quite unique and their uh, you know the choices that they make or the behavior that they show is according to the set of needs or wants or desires that they have and that is where the um, you know um, uh, the classification is done in the form of a pyramid now the question that i would primarily look at would be how is it relevant to leadership concept now when we look at uh, working as leaders or somebody who is in the position wherein you manage a lot of employees or you have responsibility for the organization your role in terms of a leader is to understand the psychology of the individual um, and to also relate it to these five layers of the pyramid that employees at certain level would primarily only be interested in money and the job uh, and the output they they will give you a certain amount of output they'll be interested in their salary or wages but beyond that their contribution to the organization might be minimal so they might come in at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock leave at 4:30 they're just normal employees then you have people within the organization who have a sense of belonging they 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 want to give more they want to contribute more and to a certain extent are conscientious of the fact that these are the needs uh, or the uh, demands maybe in the sense in terms of my job description that I have to deliver because the organization depends on it and that is where you look at those employees will be uh, you know a bit more loyal they'll be aware of the situation they'll be aware of the environment in which they work and the things happening around them then you look at certain set of employees who have say i would say high responsibilities not using the word manager but have high responsibilities in terms of you know when i say budgeting responsibility finance responsibility or things like that they will be conscious of the fact that if something is to go wrong if i make a mistake it can you know affect the organization and that is where they have a sense of belonging that today the company cares for me or the company has entrusted this responsibility to me so i have a sense uh, um, you know a duty or um, uh, a set of belonging wherein i need to make sure that whatever i do or deliver meets the set objectives of the uh, you know uh, the organization or the department objectives or the or, you know objectives given by the manager and then when you look at the top tier there the manager has full responsibility to person is not just going to be looking at managing it but also if there are issues problems with dropouts 
the individual in that position should be having the ability to be able to not only diagnose, but uh, you know, look at the symptoms, but also be able to solve and provide solutions to that problem. So that is where you would see that at times the leaders, the people who are in that position, where you supervise and have higher responsibility. I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, who was, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I can't hear. I can't hear either. I can't hear at all. You can't hear I me can't at all? Hear. No. It's quieter and quieter. Are you able to hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. But a long time. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Right, okay. So, I'm not too sure what I've raised the volume a bit, if uh, if there's a bit of difficulty in terms of the volume, but I've raised the level to the maximum. That's now, better. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So, what, what I want to do is basically look at relating this theory to why it is important when you look at the concept of leadership. So as a leader, if you understand the needs and wants of the individual within your, within working within your team, or when you look at within your organization, if you understand their needs, wants, and desires, then you can appropriately bring across some sort of a, 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 a bit later, but also put some sort of a reward strategy or a program in place which keeps the individual motivated to be able to achieve these objectives which are set by the organization or you, you are setting these objectives uh, in the team. Now, when we look at the second theory, when we talk about so, um, moving ahead from moving ahead and going forward, understanding after Maslow's theory, we look at something called the Hertzberg's theory of uh, motivation factors. Now here, when he did the research, you know, he basically looked at picking up certain factors, which he called hygiene factors, which uh, were directly related to the growth and advancement or achievement and recognition and the sense of responsibility which people want in order for them to be having job satisfaction. So here, these three or four factors that we look at when we, when we talk about uh, you know, motivation as a concept in general, people are motivated by the fact that uh, uh, because of his research, he found out that they are motivated because they are growing in the organization. They are able to achieve and able to advance in terms of, can I say the word advance, say pro get promotions or, you know, uh, after having a sense of, uh, after having achieved something, they're able to get that sense of achievement and recognition in return from the organization. And people in general want more responsibility. So when we look at hygiene factors, which, uh, you know, lead to dissatisfaction of people leaving the organization, sometimes when you look at exit interviews, you see that, uh, you know, people normally end up leaving because they feel they're not getting paid enough. So salary could be an issue because competitors are paying more. Sometimes they end up leaving because they see that the company policy is not aligning in line with their goals. Sometimes they feel that, you know, the supervisor, the person who's working does not understand and, you know, motivate them enough to be able to stay in that role. So when we look at some of these factors like, you know, working conditions, when we look at security, when we look at supervision, they tend to be what are called the hygiene factors. And that is where he said, okay, the grouping of these factors instead in the form of basic needs, psychological needs, and self-fulfillment needs, uh, as per Maslow's, um, need to be actually done in the form of something called hygiene factors, which lead to satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And factors which lead to satisfaction are, are factors which are called achievement. You know, people are recognized uh, they have the ability to grow within the organization. They get additional responsibility. And uh, in some cases, you know, the working conditions are quite nice. So here, if I take an example, and if I apply this theory to, say, one of the millennial organizations like Google. Now, if I apply this to an organization, uh, say, in the UK, when I, and in the previous uh, session, I took an example of Tesco. If I apply this, uh, you know, within an organization which is, you know, a UK organization like uh, Tesco, what we do get to see is that the 
leaders or the people within the leadership position, when they come out with a policy or a strategy, they look at these factors which basically motivate employees. And these factors could be that if you achieve your targets year on year for a period of three years, uh, you know, you are in line or due for a promotion. And that promotion with it, uh, uh, you know, uh, gets you also a rise in your salary, maybe more roles and responsibilities, and raises your stature in the organization because you've been promoted from one level to, or one grade, from one grade to the other. So when we look at that, these factors, uh, you know, have to be taken into account because you have to put some sort of plan, and that plan would be the performance management plan or a reward strategy plan in place to ensure that people who are performing well are achieving the goals and objectives set, are further motivated by the satisfaction factors which Herzberg's theory actually proposes. Now, if you have people achieving, you know, the goals and objectives set in the organization year on year, and uh, they do not get a rise in salary, like it happened in the public sector, we've faced a lot of austerity in the last couple of years. Uh, the public sector salaries did not rise. There was a freeze on the NHS, the basic, uh, you know, public sector uh, in terms of raise in their salary. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of people took either, uh, you know, voluntary retirement or there was, you know, um, you know, maybe in general, the work suffered in some of the departments because of cuts or, uh, you know, decreased, uh, you know, budgets within these public uh, departments in general. So when we look at the reasons for dissatisfaction, it could be financial reasons like salary or wages. It sometimes could be the policy. So in this case, it's not the company policy. If we talk about the public sector, it's the government policy or the policy of the chancellor, wherein because of the deficit in our budget, the austerity measures were introduced, and that led in general to a large-scale dissatisfaction within the public sector. Obviously, working conditions quite conducive. The status, obviously, people did not leave because they had job security as against the private sector. But some of the things... Uh, as we can see from this example that I've taken, uh, you know, led to a bit of dissatisfaction. So after three years or four years, you know, there was a basic rise of 1%. And only, I think, last year or a year before that, you know, it, uh, the government took a policy decision to allow the wage rise to, you know, follow what is the rise in inflation and, you know, follow that particular pattern, uh, which is going back to usual. But in general, when you look at private sector, you know, most reward programs, most programs which are put together by HR in particular, and when I say HR, you know, you're assuming that you are in that role because you're trying to understand, uh, you know, what are the motivational techniques which need to be put in place as a ground, uh, basic ground uh, reality when you have people working within the organization, they look at these broad factors. So these factors being classified as uh, hygiene factors because what he did was uh, Hertzberg divided them into two folds look at factors which basically are related to circumstances or uh, things which the employees expect and the things which employees can get when they achieve or when they meet those expectations and standards. And then we also look at, if I have to relate this to the Maslow's theory and we have to put this and equate this to the pyramid that we saw, what we can see is that if we align it in that form of a pyramid, what we do see, the motivators tend to be in this hierarchy. So you, people look at growth first. They look at, you know, opportunities to get promoted or advance in their career. They look at additional responsibility. They look at, you know, at some stage, getting hold of job roles or getting hold of responsibilities, which allow them to, you know, be responsible for their own set of work. Kind of a bit of self-independence. Let me call it independent working, which they want. And after that comes recognition. And finally, they want to be looking at getting, uh, you know, uh, recognition leads to achievement. That means if you are doing certain things right every time and on time, then at some stage you get rewarded in the organization as the best employee of the month. Or when we get to see in services sector, they have employees of the month, you have employee of the year, and, and certain type of recognitions come across when, when you look at, you know, you've spent five years in the organization, so there's a certain amount of achievement uh, which organizations have uh, years you've spent or 15 years in terms of contribution and you get those sense of, you know, achievements uh, which can be defined basis, you know, different organizations have uh, different uh, ways to define it depending on how their uh, <coughs> or how the companies have been structured. Now, 
Any questions on this so far? No. No. Okay. So let's move forward. Now, when we also look at one of the, as you can see, we are kind of moving ahead on a bit of a timeline. So we started in the 1940s, went to the 1950s. Now we are in the 1960s. And here, one of the theories which was proposed by Vroom uh, basically talked about, you know, um, a, a fact, uh, three, three uh, basic factors. So he defined something called valence. How much do I value this outcome? He looked at something called instrumentality and he looked at expectancy. So instrumentality was defined as would this lead to an identifiable outcome? What is the first level of performance and the second level of performance? Do I get rewarded if I meet the objective? Do I get a reward or uh, you know some sort of an incentive if I come second, uh, if I'm the second best? And the third was basically looking at expectancy. Can I do what is being asked from me? Do I have the skill set? Do I have the experience? And is the organization putting me in a role which basically allows me to go towards, go out and achieve success? Or are they putting me into a role wherein I would literally, uh, you know, I would basically struggle or will need to pick up skills uh, to be able to perform better in that role? So this particular theory was based around the fact that it talked about something called, uh, you know, the expectancy theory. And the expectancy theory, uh, you know, focused on this particular uh, you know, concept of something called an equation that, you know, there are three factors which basically look at motivating me and those can be defined as expectancy, instrumentality, and balance. And this is, uh, you know, known as the Vroom's theory of uh, motivation. Here, the basic purpose is to propose to an individual that, you know, we understand how you will work, we understand your skill set, we understand your experience, and we know very clearly what you expect when you achieve that objective. So the motivative, uh, the motivation is actually set to select a specific behavior over others because they know very clearly that this kind of a result will come out uh, from the individual working in that, um, in that set, uh, in that set that, uh, that will allow the person to be motivated. So it is more about mental processes here uh, in terms of the choice wherein a team is put together, um, the leader or the manager will look at picking out people which will primarily be, uh, you know, having the three key ingredients of, uh, you know, understanding that the outcome is required. Uh, there is a bit of uh, this outcome is clearly identifiable. That means if I achieve this, I will get that. If I this. And the last is that the individual clearly understands that what is expected of me when I am put together or when I'm put together as a part of that team to be able to you know, work or if I'm given that objective to be able to take that forward. So this expectancy theory that he uh, you know, came out with was uh, after the effect of you know, a lot of studies of motivations that he had done and the core essence of that was behind decision making. That means he looked at uh, you know, creating a connect between management and decision making process, wherein he said that if we are to put together a team which is going to achieve the objectives, the objectives can only be achieved if I look at the overall motivation of the individual around these three factors or three key components. And these components, when I look at expectancy, it leads to, you know, putting in the effort, and effort leads to generating, you know, performance. Instrumentality is also related to performance. And the performance is measured in the form of an outcome, which is directly related to balance. So basically three factors that he proposed. And he said that when management looks at coming out with the process of, uh, you know, um, putting together a program or putting together a team, they should look at three aspects. And these three factors, which are directly related to the output of decision making uh, at the managerial level or at the leadership level. Now, some of the questions as leaders or as people, when you wear the leadership have any responsibility for a team, and when you look at that and you pick that up, what kind of questions do, do you ask? So balance, for example, would uh, relate to questions like, how much do I value those rewards? You know, are the individuals primarily going to be motivated by a financial reward? Are they going to be looking at other forms of rewards, which could be recognition, which could be, you know, promotions, which could be some sort of a, you know, high responsibility. And when you look at instrumentality, where we talk about, you know, 
again, the outcome of the performance here, what we are likely to see is what kind of rewards can I likely receive if I complete this objective or if I achieve this task. And here, the recognition can also come in the form of, you know, um, recognition from peers or managers and also to a certain extent, uh, you know, improve job prospects in terms of, you know, you're in now, uh, you know, you've achieved this, you're now in line, uh, you know, for a promotion or you are now due for a promotion. And when we look at expectancy, the kind of questions which will be asked would be when you when you talk about, you know, that, okay, in my case, <coughs> say an individual's case, individually, they will talk about things like, you know, I need to do this performance to be able to get to this particular objective. Am I going to be putting that performance? Am I usually that, um, you know, is the organization going to trust me to be able to give this opportunity so that I can perform or, you know, meet their expectation? And sometimes these questions are questions which the leaders have asked and they go through when they look at selection, when they look at recruitment, when they look at, you know, putting together a team or when you look at putting together a team behind a job which is quite critical or important uh, in terms of its objectives being accomplished. So this particular theory looked at the aspect of, you know, uh, the three uh, components and these three components being directly related to decision making. Now, one of the other theories that we're going to look at apart from, uh, you know, this one would be the expectancy theory. And when we look at, you know, the expectancy theory here, what we are looking at is, in general, the behavior and the motivation, um, you know, which is required for you to perform in your job is something uh, which managers look at when they put together some sort of a reward mechanism. So they clearly know, they understand, uh, you know, your psychology. And when they put together some sort of a reward management structure in place, they are clearly trying to address the, uh, the main underlying theme of how to keep you motivated to be able to deliver those objectives. And they try and put rewards which are appropriate in terms of the individual performance. So that means if you put together a reward system, um, and I took an example of a call center, you will normally see that when you manage a number of agents, there are different type of people within that team, and some of them achieve more, some of them achieve less, but the team manager or the person who's actually managing that team has a reward for each and every type of individual achieving some sort of performance. So here, what they're looking at is somebody who's able to generate more leads or you know is able to solve more problems also gets an award, but somebody who's able to solve uh, and take a few calls and solve little lesser problems, like a tiered structure will also be getting an award. But the processes set are quite clear that this individual's skill set or this individual's ability to be able to achieve the goal is you know already mapped. And that is why you will see that according to the expectancy, the targets for those individuals are set. And each and every individual, depending on the performance and the target they meet, they are still able to receive awards because the expectancy, uh, you know, in terms of receiving or uh, basically looking at they achieving uh, that particular set of objectives is already set in the performance management or in the appraisal. So, they clearly know that this individual can achieve this much, this individual can achieve 90%, this individual can achieve 100%, and this individual can achieve 120 or 125%. So the reward structure is built up accordingly, wherein each and every individual in that team is motivated, and depending on their motivation and the contribution to the overall achievement of the objective, they still get rewarded, and that is where the, you know, the essence of expectancy theory, you know, comes in. Now, Apart from this, there are two other theories which we will, you can go through and I put together one or two slides. But what I want to now jump to is how do we look at the connection of, um, you know, motivation, goal setting, performance, and how does this actually play in when you look at, uh, you know, understanding leadership or manager's role. So when I look at this particular flow chart, you're looking at motivating people through goal setting. Now, this is again, one of the cities, uh, you know, and again, one of the uh, theories which basically looks at, you know, how do you look at setting a goal which the individual can achieve? And you do not set a goal where the individual cannot achieve or, you know, is, is set in a way that it uh, programs the individual to fail. No, the idea of having a goal here is, and when you look at the goal setting theory, 
the the managers and the leaders look at setting targets or goals which are achievable and then they put in some parameters which allow the individual to stretch and uh, allow them to actually achieve that goal so when we define uh, you know these uh, you know parameters in the flow chart we look at influences influences are nothing but you know incentives or uh, you know basically incentive set so if we look at an example of um, let's put it this way we look at an organization which has a sales target and in that sales target it is imperative for the organization or the manager to actually put together some sort of targets which the individuals and the teams can achieve but at the same time when they achieve those targets they are looking at uh, you know essentially ensuring that every step of the way when they achieve those targets the individuals are rewarded so basically incentives when we look at setting the goals the goals can be set on the basis of a scale or difficulty and in this case they look at other parameters which could be things like specific skill set and also look at you know commitment or loyalty towards achieving those goals which have been set if i look at strategies now here the leaders and managers play differently so the leaders would set the direction in which the annual plan is made and the you know the annual targets are set but the managers are put on those breaking those larger you know annual strategies or long term strategies are actually broken down and then managers are given the responsibility to drive it to be able to achieve them on a monthly daily weekly monthly basis and that is where these the these strategies you know differentiate the role of a manager and differentiate the role of a leader but when we look at the motivational things being put in uh, you know in terms of incentives in terms of you know the uh, the difficulty or the scale of the targets being put in that is mapped to individuals to ensure that uh, you know stretch targets are given to individuals who have the ability to achieve 100% um, you know the the individuals which are relatively new or do not have the experience will have set uh, you know targets which are done accordingly now when we look at um, you know the application of those strategies at some stage what they do is they come in and map the individuals skill set the ability and the other hygiene factors which we talked about things like you know salary achievement recognition what is important so you classify and you rank those uh, you know parameters to be able to say that okay this will work now but two months down the line because the individual would have achieved this we will need to put in some additional rewards to be able uh, to keep the individual motivated and if we look at performance at some stage you know if it's a yearly plan three months down the line you'll do a quarterly review or a six monthly review and what you will start to do then is start to measure the performance and see the output is it making a difference or do we need to course correct that and introduce new things or you know different things so that the results could be different so here the measurement of performance actually in a way indirectly or directly starts so sometimes you see in organizations or on a day to day basis in businesses you will see most managers in the morning give some tasks that this needs to be done by the end of the day so when you uh, finish work could you report back to me saying that this has been completed or this has not been completed so you want a bit of a state status on that and that is where you're actually measuring the daily performance of the uh, individual or the person to which you've given task now if i take this slightly higher in most cases if you are not managing that employee directly or the staff directly but you are a head of department you might manage uh, you know primarily uh, individuals who are managing the Uh, under you and here you will give out weekly targets and what you will do is okay you will say let's discuss and review this every monday that what i've basically said has been what has not completed or what has been completed and if there are issues or problems you discuss so that we can uh, you know come out with solutions to be able to achieve that and if i look at the top management they normally have monthly meetings or senior management council meetings and here the idea of having those meetings would be to generally discuss Uh, the performance level of the organization or a department or a set of individual teams to see if they are performing enough and if they are not performing enough then what kind of course correction or feedback which can be received which needs to be put into the system 
so that uh, you know it kind of course corrects and the the organization the teams the individuals are able to move in that direction of you know achieving the goals so this is the modern concept of what we see as something called goal setting theories and when we look at goal setting theories this is what we generally see in organizations that you know um, managers and uh, you know individuals uh, when i say most managers and leaders essentially end up using uh, you know primarily when when they look at you know, the concept of motivation and how want to look at you know uh, putting this forward now this was incidentally proposed by edwin locke and this is again one of the theories which was proposed in the early 1960s this theory was very specific because it talked about that when you put motivational factors into place what you look at is that you essentially link it to performance of the individual or the team or that department so that very clear goals are set and if the goals are achieved and if the performance is met then the incentives or the rewards which the team or the individuals are higher so if the individual wants higher rewards higher uh, you know incentives then you can set goals and targets accordingly because it kind of uh, you know is a uh, allows you to then keep uh, you know um, let's put it this way um, allows you to actually keep and set targets which can be aligned in terms of how the performance is being uh, you know underlined or how the performance is uh, how the output of the performance is being measured so sometimes you will see in the sales teams in particular or in service team in particular they are always striving to achieve you know 96% customer satisfaction or 100% customer satisfaction but even a 0.5% change is a huge change and that requires a lot of effort which goes in from the team so the the push from the management is in small increments but these small increments when they are achieved individuals are also getting rewarded because the target setting or the goal setting is being done in such a way that is is directly linked to the performance of the team or the is that okay is that okay with everyone yes okay now what we want what i want to do is obviously after this in terms of a bit of a brief background and what we've covered today what we want to look at is focus on you know the key um, you know the assessment criteria of the tasks and how, what do we want to relate in those tasks so before i go into that do you have any questions no right okay so when we look at you know the assessment criteria 2.1 you know analyze the key motivational theories and how they influence organizational success now we are looking at basically a couple of theories so here when i say analyze you will look, you will at least need to pick up two and explain them and then relate it to an organization so if i have to give you a bit of an example here of what we've looked at today we've looked at about four or five theories i've skipped a few which is the theory z the x and y theory the acquired needs theory but there are a few theories you know as we progress along in some sort of a timeline we get to see that these theories you know have kept pace with how the structure of management and leadership within the organization has shaped up in the last few years so if i pick up one or two theories and i look at an example going back to again um, a simple example of uh, picking up a retailer like tesco or any of the big posts like asda and sainsbury if i pick up that as an organization what we'll get to see is that a lot of managers on the ground if i look at a store they put daily targets in place and the daily targets they the reason why they put daily targets in place is that they want certain achievement of these objectives to be done on a daily basis which then compile into a weekly objective which then further compile into a monthly objective to be achieved a simple example here that i would probably quote would be that most store managers want to minimize pilferage or you know theft from the store so they ask most of the people working within those shifts you know where they work within shifts ask most of the employees working within the shift to be quite vigilant and the reason why they do is that they need to they need to keep make sure that that they minimize the you know the uh, the the whole concept of theft happening from the store and that helps them directly save you know um, uh, or uh, say reduce loss into the store because if the stock gets uh, you know stolen 
But if the stock gets, for example, um, uh, you know, used, wherein there's a breakage, there's a spillage, uh, sometimes you will see customers have something in the store, they drop it into the bins, and you know, you, you have stock or inventory, uh, you know, being lost, and it's directly related to cost. So what they tend to do in that case is put some daily targets in place, and these daily targets, what they put in place, essentially look at, you know, also um, uh, incentivize people working within different ships or within different teams. And here, the idea of having that is to minimize as a team the uh, the whole concept of theft or pilferage or you know picking uh, from the store. So they make use of the you know motivational theories because sometimes on certain days they put in a cash reward, for example, and they'll say, okay, if you stop and if you spot an incident, you know, the, and if that leads to the um, you know if it leads to the uh, you know the person being caught, then you know uh, the person involved in that would end up receiving a you know a, a cash award of 50 pounds or stock worth some pounds from the store and that tends to be a motivational uh, you know a way the manager puts it across wherein he then gets everybody uh, you know behind it and then you know he has that objective also being the good there are good chances of that objective being actually met because uh, everybody then looks out that okay, I, I could be picking up that reward because I need the money, or I could be looking at this, and that's a very small example of how store managers would then look at using and understanding the psychology of the individual in terms of their needs to be able to put some sort of a reward or incentive in place to say that you know if this is met, you get you you get this. Another example of that, if I stretch this slightly, would be we've just gone past you know the Christmas and Boxing Day sale period. Now, most stores and most store managers want you to maximize sales. So what they do is they put some incentives in, uh, which are rewards and incentives, which is within their remit of, you know, doing it from the store kitty or, you know, from the store budget. And the idea of that is that they normally want the more maximum customers to be served. They want to get in the maximum business in those two days. And they might have an internal, you know, uh, competition or something which basically says the store getting the maximum revenue on these two days you know, will be in line for some sort of a financial reward. But in order to drive that down into their own individual stores and their teams, they also break that down into smaller incentives and, you know, motivate the staff by putting in some incentive or uh, some sort of a reward, which, uh, which drives the employees to, you know, try and achieve as much revenue as possible during the, you know, the Boxing Day sales. So here in this particular task, what you have to look at is, uh, explain one or two motivational theories and explain it with an example of choosing an organization now whether it's uh, you know within the healthcare sector services sector you know the telecom sector you might choose your favorite in terms of picking up a sector but the idea here would be to look at defining how some of these rewards for example in the healthcare sector these might not be financial rewards these might be rewards which are related to more of uh, more related recognition or sense of achievement because you've gone out and provided exceptional service, uh, which is which is expected from the employees, or you know you've set a new standard. But when I look at this in a different organization, which could be financial services, retailing, or a sales organization, you will primarily have some sort of a financial reward because it helps you or the individuals on um, you know and the teams in that particular uh, sector to achieve more revenue or you know meet a particular target, and that is why you know financial rewards are set. So they might vary, but the idea here is to utilize the two or three theories, explain them, and after the explanation, elaborate that with a bit of an example of how this is used within your organization. If you want to bring in a particular example, bring it, uh, you know, from your point of view or the organization that you work within uh, and put that example in. In the second task, if I look at what we are looking at is we are looking at basically talking about the role of leadership and management in employee motivation. So here we have to kind of draw some of the conclusions that we took in learning outcome one, which is differentiation between manager and leader and what kind of qualities or traits and attributes are shown by people in the leadership position and by people in the managerial position. And we have to talk about that and related to the concept of motivation. So things like when we look at focus on task completion, we look at sense of responsibility, achievement, 
you know those kind of things are more related to uh, you know uh, i would say managers but when we talk about things which are related to um, you know uh, things which are from a long term perspective that okay the quarterly target has been met or when we talk about things like the six monthly target has been met then this is where you are looking at the long term view and here is what you are looking at the broader picture and you are looking at from a leadership perspective and you are bringing that in uh, uh, you know by putting together a few arguments in terms of how leaders look at motivating employees so an example that i would give here would be i'll go back to a company like uh, a large company for example or a, a you know organization wherein you have number of employees you have lot of objectives to be met so when you look at a productized when you look at a large organization like bt for example and when you look at bt bt has lots of different products and there the concept is you're looking at managing these products and services and each of these products and services you know are individual spus or strategic uh, business units and they have to achieve the targets to be able to ensure that the overall target that the organization achieves the overall target so when i look at say for example bt broadband when i look at phone services when i look at telecom infrastructure or when i look at for example services which bt provides now obviously bt open reach is a different company so when we look at some of the services which are infrastructure but leased out and other providers use it they are all independent units they all have to function in tandem for bt to be able to achieve overall objectives so when we look at that leadership here would be having uh, or broken down the top management when i look at the c level leadership so cx so you know underneath that you'll have lots of individual strategic business heads and those strategic business heads would need motivation to be able to drive it down in their teams departments you know various uh, sections to be able to achieve the objective so here they are given the freedom to be able to put together programs into place which are incentive programs which keep their employees motivated and they know best how to get that job done so they broke break it down into uh, you know smaller objectives smaller objective into micro objectives and then it distills down into the organization which is within the spu and here they might use uh, when i say motivational techniques so the say the department heads or the vice presidents or you know you call it the directors will essentially receive an x amount of incentive which could be you know uh, not just a financial reward like a bonus or a, a you know increase in salary but they might get a percentage share of the profit which their spu has generated but if i drill down a bit lower into say middle management they might be in line to get financial rewards a bit of uh, you know increase in their pay but apart from that a fixed bonus they might get but when you drill down further into lower management or people who are on the front line they will basically get a fixed financial reward or maybe some sort of a fixed financial pay rise at the end of it they are able to achieve and help achieve the organization objective so differentiate between the role of leadership when they look at reward management and uh, you know when they look at uh, schemes or long term vision broadly speaking to be able to ensure that the organization achieves the objective and when you look at the management side of things right, the focused here on task completion on a daily weekly you know quarterly basis monthly basis and the idea would be to look at solving problems and issues and that is where their motivation would be to look at you know bringing in what we uh, discussed earlier was that they, they look at uh, or a daily picture they look at the picture on a day to day basis as against uh, people in the leadership position who look at a bit longer term and that could be 3 months 6 months and then on on a on an annual basis when we look at you know the organization setting goals and objectives and 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 the last task that we look at here would be to look at you know understanding performance management uh, you know techniques now there are different uh, performance management techniques now here we are going to draw down onto the two or three that we know and we we have used or have seen these be used in the organization the first and foremost that we look at is appraisals so appraisals primarily are done on a yearly basis with hr and your manager line manager and these appraisals basically look at evaluating your uh, job description against the objective set or the key result areas and how well you achieved them or how well you have fared on those objectives and that is a measurement which is done through the uh, technique called appraisals the 
appraisals can be classified as different types they could be peer appraisals they could be self appraisals and obviously the formal appraisal which is done by your line manager now when we look at appraisals which happen from peers customers you know different uh, people who work with you in the team your line manager and even the hr that kind of appraisal is what we also consider under performance management technique and they are called the 360 degree appraisals that means everybody within the organization who works directly or indirectly with you has the ability to be able to uh, you know look at uh, doing your uh, appraisal and in those cases sometimes these appraisals which are called the 360 degree appraisals are actually uh, you know sent out as questionnaires or surveys by the hr and primarily done either at the middle management or at the senior management level and the idea there is to basically collectively uh, you know collect feedback um in terms of you know um basically feedback which, which could be different types of feedback in terms of how the individual has worked within a team within uh, the department and you know to a certain extent um you know within uh, his or her particular role and the performance man and the third type of technique that i will give you a bit of a handout on which i have not covered in slide is is called the balanced scorecard method and when we look at the balanced scorecard method you know this was uh, you know basically proposed as a, a performance management tool you know by um after a lot of research but obviously this was uh, you know um, uh, proposed in the early 1950s and this particular uh, you know technique is used in organizations wherein what you want to be able to do is um, you know it was proposed by two um, you know people who worked on um, on on this particular model which was Kaplan and Norton and what they basically came out after a lot of study in the early 1990s was that they wanted to basically link the performance of the individual to the performance of the organization and they wanted to classify this into some sort of financial and non financial data so what they said is when you work and you align the objectives of the organization uh, 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 align the objectives of the individuals with the objectives of the organization you are able to have a better uh, uh, you know um, better go at the let, let's put it this way better uh, chances of the organization achieving the objectives and this technique in which they came up with which is something called the balanced scorecard they proposed that each of the performance factors which are to be included within the measurement process have a direct relation to either financial or non non financial uh, data within the organization and here they said that no single uh, you know um, uh, parameter basically uh, works independently so they look at you know the four prospects of how the business is run which is if you have customers you have business if you have a product you have uh, you have a business if you have the ability to be able to offer a product and service that means the company has products and services to offer that is why the business model is and if they have the financial viability and the processes to be able to offer this to customers or clients outside then you know the targets have to be set in such a way that they incorporate these four factors into the target setting or the goal setting for all the individuals working within the organization and here the four broad perspectives of the uh, you know performance were put together as a model called the balanced scorecard model so uh, put together by you know obviously in the early 1990s by two scientists who work on worked on this and they said that you know most businesses should actually align uh, you know strategies or activities around um, you know the organizational objectives and they need to be in line with what is being set for individuals working within the organization so again this is a technique which uh, you know managers and leaders in particular use and they use it because it helps companies focus on um you know focus primarily on uh, you know looking at just what has been achieved against the objective set so basically performance but also it binds both the organization the individual and the corporate uh, the objectives of the organization into one single uh, thread and allows the measurement of you know the individual the organization and what the output has been to be measured either in financial or non financial terms so these three things uh, you know when we look at the performance management techniques we classify them very broadly as you know things like appraisal we look at peer or self appraisals we also call them uh, you know in, in the second instance when 
the organization is appraising uh, as 360 degree appraisals. And then last but not the least, when we look at one of the other techniques, which looks at bringing everything together, the organizational strategy, um, the, the products and services the company offers, and also the capacity to be able to offer these using process and policies, uh, which is the balanced scorecard method. So these three uh, you know, methods have to be covered in this particular task, which is basically talking about you know, um, on the performance management techniques and how they contribute towards you know, organizational performance. Is that okay? Yes. I know it's been... Uh, I've, long I've got to go. Uh, all right, okay, that's fine. So we'll end the session here, and uh, I'm going to send across the copy of the presentation recording um, just after this okay. session, along with the handout, uh, which will hopefully help you to, you know, put some uh, more details into what we've discussed today. Thank you so much for joining the session, and everybody have a good weekend. I'll catch up with you next week. Thank you. Bye.